Hello and welcome everybody to the last of the 2023 food season events and what a banger to go out on with Nigella, Jonathan and Rebecca. My name is Polly Russell and I'm the um, curator for the food season but I work very closely with Melissa Thompson and Angela Cotton and have done for the last three years, two years, um, programming conversations about food which take in all aspects of food, food and politics, food and pleasure, food and history. If it's about food and it's interesting, we try and program it. And this year has been an absolutely fantastic year, thanks in large part to the amazing talents of Melissa and Angela, who are huge fun to work with and have brilliant ideas, as does Joe, our fantastic food um, work experience intern, who's been wonderful as well. We've had events on food and feeding old people. We've had um, food and the feminist table with Rebecca earlier this month, last month. Jonathan with um, London Finds Itself. We've had events on LGBTQ plus and the food industry. So many. I just so many, it's been rich and fantastic, but this is really a wonderful way to end. So thank you so much for everybody, friends who are very familiar to us, new people for the food season. Uh, please keep an eye out for the food season for 2024. We'll be com com coming back again, bigger and better. Um, but for now- Excuse me. What? <laughs> <laughs> Nigella's gonna do 10 <laughs> events. <laughs> Coming back 2024 in a muted and less impressive way. <laughs> Unless Nigella and Rebecca and Jonathan will come back again. Um, and, but for now, I'm just going to hand over to Angela for one moment. We wanted our last moment in the sun. That's why we're all yeah. here today. The danger of this all turning into a massive love-in. Um, I think we've already set the tone for this. It's going to be a very uh, relaxed and fascinating uh, night tonight. Um, there will be questions coming quite through the session, so if you have something to ask, you will have an opportunity, and there will be microphones roving around. We have audience joining us online as well, and you'll be able to find a function to ask questions. <coughs> and at the end, uh, we have a bookstall set up outside, and Nigella and Rebecca will be there signing books. Sadly, we don't have Jonathan's book in print at the moment, but if you'd like to get a book signed, you can do so at the end. And here is Melissa to tell you more about what we have tonight. Right then, so, um, uh, hand to mouth, the multiple lives of the sandwich, um, and Jonathan is kind of going to be chairing this event, but not really. If, if you don't know, Jonathan founded Vittles, um, a online newsletter, which is just some of the most groundbreaking, um, occasionally provocative, just really insightful writing that's kind of changed food media. Um, that happened in 2020. He's multiple award winning. Um, and just an all-round great guy. And um, joining him is Nigella Lawson and Rebecca May Johnson. He will introduce um, his co-panelist. He's kind of cheering, but not really, um, I think is the thing. And <laughs> beyond the title, <laughs> beyond the title, I mean, I was gonna say, I don't wanna say too much about it, but to, but truth be told, I don't really know that much about what they're gonna be talking about. It's Nor do we. <laughs> well, so let's just crack to it. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. So um, enjoy everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm nominally hosting tonight, but we thought, we discussed this before, and we thought we'll do like a um, Alex Ferguson formation versus Roma with no striker. We <laughs> have flat three. Um, we're just going to talk. Um, the only hosting I'm going to do is actually just to introduce everyone. So, I mean, you know them both already, but Rebecca Mae Johnson, um, who is the author of a brilliant book called Small Fires, um, she also edits Dinner Document, and she's one of my fellow editors at Vittles, uh, along with Sharanya Deepak, who is possibly somewhere here as well. Um, and uh, Nigella Lawson, uh, author, Gramsci scholar, Twitter reply guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, she sold over 8 million books. 12, and actually. 12 million. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, once ate 30 pickled eggs in a sitting. Is but that... for a bit, yes. 
Um, I think we're just going to start. I mean, why did we... I'm not sure why we decided that sandwiches was going to be the thing. I think it was your idea. I think... Uh, British, blame me, yes. I think, I, it was a bit because I think that it's something we're interested in. I know I'm more interested in it from the d domestic perspective, and I think you're more interested uh, in it from a... Eating out. Mm, eating out, uh, mm. sort of brought in experience of it as to more as a what's what what what's available in London and what it speaks of and Rebecca is here to translate both into a cohesive whole now I'm going to start now I I want to read something because it th th that um, it made me think of sandwiches in a very different way and actually um, in a rather chilling way and I'm sorry to start on a <laughs> negative note but I saw a tweet not long ago, someone called Patrick Nathan, who I don't know, and he said, the open face sandwich implies that a conventional sandwich's face is inside of its body and gazes <laughs> inward upon itself, forever enfolded in reflective darkness. Now, this, this disturbed me, partly that obviously an open sandwich, I, I, I think the taxonomy of a sandwich is perhaps the least interesting aspects of the conversation, but nevertheless, an open-faced sandwich is not really a sandwich. But why it troubled me is that I've always thought of sandwiches as something that's sort of comforting and happy, almost as if you take the ingredient and you're tucking it up in bed, as you might a child. And now, this idea of it forever enfolded in protective darkness makes me think of a sandwich as something more claustrophobic. These poor sandwiches that get absolutely clamped together when all they want to be do is, is gaze, to gaze outward at the world. So now I feel there's an element of cruelty about the sandwich which I'd never thought of before. I think, I, I think we should go straight to questions. <laughs> I think there's both an intimacy that feels quite private and a publicness about sandwiches that maybe that quote kind of brings out the extremes of. Because yes. I feel like with a cut sandwich, it kind of advertises its innards. Yes. Um, but also there's something quite private about eating a sandwich in, in a public space, I think. Well, uh, I, I'm not, sorry, you, sorry. Oh, I, I'm mean, going to you know, hit you with your got, papers. I mean, I've just got some quotes written down here from people um, I like about sandwiches, but that inadvertently hit one of them, which, yeah. which was um, about, you can see the sandwich, and it displays its innards. When confronted by a sandwich, men fall into two distinct camps, the meat and the bread. There are those who'll stick it in their gobs and chew, and there are those who'll open it, lift the lid, have to know what's on the inside. How men approach a beef on brown tells you a lot about them. There are those of you who take sandwiches on trust as passive feeders, and those of us who are pathfinders, <laughs> explorers, <laughs> who dare to boldly go. That was A.A. A. Gill. Yes, but not one of his best. And no. I loved no. his I writing. Like I, got, I got lost halfway through. But, that. you know, I feel... so. I, I think much more, as I say, I'm interested in is a domestic activity. And what I think... There's a, the, the, the personal quality of the sandwich... One, I think sandwiches are one of the most personal foods you can have. We, we're very rooted to what we want in a sandwich. But, but I think a bit is that... And perhaps this is why a lot of people feel happy making sandwiches, because the, the parameters are fairly narrow. I'm not saying that they don't broaden out once you think of what's going in a sandwich. But you know how if you do yoga or any sort of exercise, you have, the, you have your yoga mat, and everything happens in there, and it's quite a, a stabilising experience. And with a sandwich, when you make it, your constraints are similar. They're, the, they're the, the bread that's there. You're not... You don't have the challenge of filling every part of a plate. You're not trying to bring too many disparate things together. And if you are, you know it doesn't have to be bigger than that piece of bread. And I think you're building on something that feels comfortable, whether before I thought of it as a mattress or a yoga mat, and now I must think of it as you know, some sort of wall that's going to come nearer and nearer, um, <laughs> like in the end bit of Batman, 
when they, you know, they know that something terrible is happening. But I think there is something about the sandwich that feels that it can be an expression of the person making it. Yeah. And it, you, th there's, in a way, for me, the perfect sandwich is something that uses leftovers you have. And because of that, it doesn't presume upon, you know, a shopping expedition. It doesn't presume upon knowledge of cooking. It doesn't presume upon um, any particular theory of eating. You just put what you want in it and you close its lid and you, you sort of have your own experience. And I think that's very important. Yeah. Yeah, I think... It it's, as you say, it's a sort of safe space, even for those who aren't particularly confident at cooking. And very little washing up, exactly. which is very important, because it means it's an exercise almost sort of dedicated to the pleasure of the eater. Mm. I actually think sandwiches should be eaten over the sink sometimes. <laughs> it does save some time. Yeah, but you're, you're you know, to... You're, relatively speaking, at least to me, a young person. And um, so you like sandwiches, I feel, that perhaps are slightly influenced by the American tradition, which is an overstuffed sandwich. And I don't... Listen, and that can be wonderful, but I now, the older I get, the more I like the thin sandwiches of my youth. I find there's something so lovely about that feel when the bread and it's got a teeny bit in it and it's just squished together that it isn't about showmanship it's just about comfort a british rationing sandwich i'm not that old no, no. but yes. <laughs> yeah but i the other thing that really interested me actually maybe you know because for me everything is comes back to death but um <laughs> I was looking at, earlier today, I suddenly thought, oh, I must actually you know, do some research. And I uh, were, downloaded B. Wilson's book about the sandwich. And there's, so she posits that the earliest sandwich is from the Passover meal, when, because the matzo that you have at Passover, that she originally was much more like a soft flatbread. And the bitter herbs that, and the haroset, you know, the, the, that was that sort of odd chutney, rather delicious, that w is there to represent the mortar between the bricks in the uh, pyramids. Uh, and she, so that was it. And so what's quite interesting is that um, she says that the, it's, it was called Koresh, I don't know how to pronounce it, sorry, or karash, meaning to encircle, embrace, or surround. It is the same word used to denote the structure of, a, of book binding as well as the enveloping of a shroud. And I rather, I rather like that. So that it is something that somehow within a, that earlier sandwich, there is this notion that you are somehow enclosing something in you know, that there is a shroud around it, that there is something private. Mm. And I find that still, even though sandwiches are very different, I feel that's still very current, that, that, that there's something about a sandwich that, you know, you, you sort of feel like, I'm not going to question you all, but I might, that the <laughs> sandwiches people like tells you an awful lot about the person. Now, for me, a bit a sandwich is a bit about a nostalgic thing, the sort of thing you'd be given as a child. Whereas the the sandwich can be this big flashy thing that's asking you to take part in different cultures and how sandwiches are made. Are they wraps? Are they buns? Or are they whatever? It doesn't really matter. It's this notion of this portable, enclosed bite of food. Yeah, I think like there's. For me, there's like two types of sandwiches. There's domestic sandwiches and there's sandwiches that you have when you're out. And they're yeah. two different things. And domestic sandwiches are kind of 
a canvas to display kind of personality. Yes. And there are sandwiches that I've made for myself, which I'd be annoyed if I got served while I was out. <laughs> um, but in that moment, I want them. But then yeah. I think the outside sandwich is this kind of canvas for, it's often like a yeah, nationality culture. Yes. Um, Could I add, to add a third category? Yes. Uh, I third category. Probably switch. more categories, yes. but I hosted a, a wake for somebody um, on Friday and there were sandwiches at the wake, and they're a sort of perfect food at a wake. But also, I feel like that's not quite a public sandwich, nor is it mm. a private sandwich. I don't know what it is, a borderline institutional sandwich, but um, a rite of passage sandwich. A but symbolic sandwich. Symbolic. And they were sort of thick finger sandwiches, and we got a local cafe uh, to make them, and they put them on big trays. And they were sort of... And my dad, who gave the eulogy, it was one of his close friends who died, wasn't really capable of doing much. He was sort of numbed. Yeah. And I could just give him this plate. And they just sort of, they weren't demonstrative, something that was too flashy or ostentatious yeah. or too rich or messy would have stained his shirt or he didn't have to reckon with anything. Yeah. There was a real quietness about it. Um, but they were really brilliantly made. Um, they were with sliced bread with a crust crust cut off um, and they also required no washing up critically because we also had to wash up after the, the yeah. wake but there wasn't really much because of that um, and they were they were just absolutely brilliant because everyone with or without teeth <laughs> because they were both <laughs> they were both you know toddlers there and very old people and all, everything in between so it was a very brilliant yeah and it held us all together because I also yeah. think you need something when you you have that sort of shock of grief you yes. Something to, anyway, so I feel like I'm. I'm just adding. No, you're right. Funeral yeah. sandwiches. But I think. But I think the the washing up, no washing up thing is really perhaps crucial when it comes to the fact that if you order a sandwich out, that you know it will have more components perhaps that have to be cooked freshly for the sandwich, because you can do that because you're not doing the washing up. You're not looking for something to eat fast. I mean, in terms of making it, because they, someone else has made it. I think like the institutional sandwich is actually a third category of itself, because then you've got supermarket, well, kind of the prep boots sandwich, which is obviously the most like eaten sandwich in the UK, and that wouldn't fit into either of those two categories. And like kind of a joyless affair, but then you kind of... <laughs> You I can't imp do, you I imprint can't do upon, a chilled sandwich. No, you but like people imprint upon like certain sandwiches, like certain yes. industrially made sandwiches, and then they they keep. Yes, but that, that, that becomes like, a personality signifier yeah. that people who like the prawn cocktail sandwich. Yeah. Or, I did a huge tasting of all sandwiches about thirty-five years ago, <laughs> and I'm trying to remember now when they were still quite a thing. You know, when it was still a bit of a novelty. Um, I can't remember which did did best but people are seem to be particularly fond of the ones which they probably first had as a treat like their grandparents might have bought an M&S sandwich whereas it would have been an extravagance did you ever get asked home. to consult on sandwiches no sadly not it's a really big missed opportunity there's sure I, lots of people I, watching well I accept that I think that the, the thing is the filling in a sandwich is so personal mm. And Could you tell us about your personal sandwich? Well, the one I gave you both. I yeah. did come, I did bring them both sandwiches. I, so I, got, I got a text like half an hour before I got here saying, <laughs> <laughs> I have sandwiches, gherkins and vodka. <laughs> <laughs> <And> <laughs> I've had the sandwiches and the gherkin and there's some vodka left. Um, <laughs> there's a sandwich I always take with me when I'm on the road. And unlike the normal way of eating, when you, you want to think, you know, what's going to be most delicious, what's going to be different, or, or what's going to be the same, but in a particular way, I need things, like, before you talk about food or before you do anything, if you're a bit nervous, you can't really have food. So you have to, I have to have the same sandwich all the time, which is just really salt, fat, and stodge and so it's a sandwich that well I wrote about I wrote about a variety about it in my first book and we're like yeah it's a recipe but actually uh, um, it's I used to do a Marmite sandwich I'm a bit more Vegemite uh, prone now um, and you you make a kind of savoury buttercream by whipping 
the butter with either the Marmite or the Vegemite. So you have a, it looks like peanut butter. Mm -hmm. Um, you get more butter in that way, but this weather is not conducive to it at its finest point because it goes a bit greasy. And I know that that's what I take everywhere I go because I don't like leaving the house without food. And it's very comforting, that salt and the sweetness of the bread. But it's not, you know, it's not the greatest sandwich of all time, but there is something about the familiarity of it and the fact that it just, for me, signifies food without it being something I have to respond to, or I can eat even when I'm too nervous to eat. I mean, actually, I'm never really too nervous to eat, but anyway. <laughs> that is, is but, you know, in terms of what sandwiches, for, I think we were discussing this the other day, and we had to say we had to stop talking. I like quite like um, a simple sandwich. I like a salt beef sandwich on rye. Perfect. I like a bacon sandwich, an egg and bacon sandwich, a sausage sandwich. That to me, those are the, the, the greatest sandwiches. That warm, the, 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 the way that the warmth of the filling makes the butter start melting into the bread. But also, obviously, if you're making a sausage sandwich or a bacon sandwich, you've got the bacon fat to dip mm. into. So it's a, it's, I think there is a way in which that sort of sandwich just feels... Like, it's giving you everything and there's very little there. Yeah. I mean, I think you mischaracterise my taste in sandwiches by saying <laughs> that I love Actually, maximalism. Like, th th but those are the sandwiches right. that I love as well. So yeah. You like uh, fish, they can, fish finger sandwiches. Well, fish finger sandwich. Fish finger sandwich I'm, is, god, is god tier. But, like, after... <laughs> <laughs> Where did you learn that? <laughs> maybe from you, maybe from you. Uh, You finessed that, didn't you, during... Well, no, because I, 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 I don't write recipes, but I recently wrote um, something for a, a great bookshop called Tender Books, and they, um, they put out a recipe book recently. You can get it from their shop. Um, but it was 14 recipes for fish finger sandwiches. And it was kind of a journey of, like, my... Um, the last kind of 20 years spent making fish finger sandwiches for myself because obviously a fish finger sandwich would have been the first thing I made for myself rather than having a parent make it for me. Yeah. Um, and sort of going through all the kind of maximalist variations on it, so like just put it in a Breville, melted cheese, like all this stuff, and then just coming back to like actually what I want is like fish fingers, which I, I tend to fry in butter rather than put in the oven. Um, and No one can argue with that. No. <laughs> and mayonnaise. And, uh, and no lettuce. No lettuce. I mean, like, lettuce I would add, but like, I could do without lettuce. And, like, maybe some in Kona, but that's it. Right. Mm. Yeah. I do like lettuce. I think, like, but I think if, it, if it's lettuce, then maybe, like, lettuce, tartar. You have a preference for the type of lettuce. Um, Iceberg versus round lettuce. You no, know, round lettuce doesn't belong in the fish finger sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Does it? Because you want a bit of crunch. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Although I often make it because it's often a meal I might have when I haven't really thought about what I make because it's generally what's in the freezer. It yeah. tends to be with whatever lettuce I have. Yes, well, that, yes. I, but yeah, no, I, I, I'm very fond of round lettuce, but you're right. It I love it. round lettuce, but I, I don't know that, that its, yeah. its modest appeal <laughs> comes through in a sandwich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's too soft for a sandwich. Yes. Yeah. Apart from I quite like it in a chicken sandwich. Anyway. Yeah, I, no, I can see that. And that's, in a way, the interesting thing about a sandwich. And I think about eating generally. We, we talk about taste such a lot. But as anyone who's ever fed a baby, or we, that actually we respond much more keenly to texture mm. than we do to taste. And when a small child doesn't like a food, it's generally because of the texture. And even, indeed, when adults don't like a food, it's often about the texture. And I think the sandwich is exciting because it has great such potential for texture that you that and that's the that is actually more important than the tastes that go into it yeah i don't like get on my high horse too much about this but like i think this is like the thing which 
sandwich makers in London generally like don't understand. Um, there's like a, I think like sandwich is like sandwich making is like very much an architecture. It's very much it's almost mm. like separate from cooking. Yes, no, and it's engineering. That's what yeah. people it's engineering more than uh, cooking. And there's there's so many there's so many as, as especially during the pandemic when everyone had to kind of pivot to doing something else. A lot of like chef led sandwiches, and I think the danger of chefs making sandwiches is that they have the compulsion to put too much in it to show off to show like what they know. Um, and you end up getting like very, very overstuffed, very like sandwiches which have no kind of um, no kind of thought for like who is eating this sandwich. Because like the basic like the basic unit of a sandwich is the human mouth. So <laughs> you, one, you actually like need to be able to fit it in your yeah, mouth. And like, I mean, and that's I, the American influence. That is, but so, I, I also think it's a social media influence as well. Like yeah, I, I I'm against my better judgment, so I, I try to ruthlessly curate my Instagram feed. So all I get in reels are snooker shots, because, <laughs> and people playing snooker and people playing pool. Um, but sometimes I like see something and I get annoyed <laughs> and I click on it, and now my whole feed is like top ten lists of things in London, which I violently oh disagree gosh. with. <laughs> <laughs> but like a lot, a lot of it is like overstuffed sandwiches, mm. which have like primarily been made for TikTok and Instagram, and I don't think. But it's a bit like those cakes which have seven layers, which you couldn't cut. Yeah. You know, it, it, those things aren't for eating; they're for viewing. But I don't know. I mean, restaurant sandwiches can also be good because they can also be the result of a kind of a, a really sort of whittled down manifesto. Like Jeremy, you're here, aren't you, Jeremy? Your your smoked eel sandwich is just ridiculously just good. good. But then, but then that's also like, I mean, Jeremy's never been known to like be minimalist, like normally, because like the the but the, pud also, but but the pud a, no, but it's, it's not a maximalist sandwich. That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the, yeah. the pud Jeremy's puddings are amazing and maximalist, but the sandwich is very pared back. There's no yeah. ingredient that I would add or take away from no, that yes. sandwich. So it's, it's kind of an unchefy sandwich in a way. It's a beautiful sandwich. It's very well balanced. We all, we all had one, had it together. We did. We <laughs> had. We did. We we uh, we we, we, we went tried to, to have a meeting sandwich about our sandwich talk, and then in fact we just ate. Yeah. Which is good too. We did no planning, and we said actually like let's just like let's know. wing it. Like, yeah. <laughs> so this is we you know I started with the. Uh, open sandwich, but I don't believe in. So <laughs> this is someone in 1944, there was a nutritionist who said, who compared the sandwich, sandwich's top half to a coffin lid, which spells death for flavor. <laughs> back to death so you see, I'm back to death, but it is quite interesting that, that I think the thing that's important in a sandwich is you can't just think about the fillings. The bread is important. Yeah. And the bread is, in a way, what makes it also always feel understandable. Because even though bread isn't something everyone makes anymore, there is something that it seems to me that the, the, the sort of essential human food stuff that you're just taking wheat and water. Yeah. And I think that it's this notion that you, you can't... Uh, this is when I find it's quite difficult if it's all about this big filling and then the bread is just somehow trying to hold it in. But the bread is very important and to the sandwich. I think last week was a centenary of the invention of sliced bread. Um, it was invented 100 years ago in the US, and that's become, I, I, to my shame or whatever, watch a lot of TikTok, <clears throat> and there's quite a lot of people on TikTok making sandwiches for, like, their 10 children. Um, and there is, yeah, this, well, it's, we might, yeah, I don't know what it looks like. But anyway, they sort of lay out 20 pieces of sliced mm. bread and then you see it all go on and it, I don't know, it's like a construction work or something. Actually. Yes, but it's rather mesmerising yes. to watch. Yeah. It's very satisfying to watch. But yeah. I like it in sandwich bars. I don't really yeah. want to do that, but I like seeing yeah. people assemble a sandwich. And also I think a sandwich is one of the few foodstuffs, I think pizza is also there, which is if you're watching a film and you see someone <laughs> eating either a sandwich or a bit of pizza, you want to eat it. Yeah. 
I mean, it's yeah. very hard not to feel that way. I love reading in books. If someone's eating a sandwich, I just feel instantly more connected. Yes. To the book. Um, and I, I really, your Vegemite sandwich to me is such a, the kind of journey, the journeyman sandwich. Yes. You know, the, the sandwich that's always rescuing you in any situation. One of the things I like most about the rice writer Ursula Le Guin's books is that yeah. she never forgets that people need to eat when they're on crazy yes. adventures, even if there's magic, and they always have bread, and they're always kept alive by it. And I, I, when you mentioned the Vegemite that you always have with you, I feel like that, yeah. Well, I think that, you, know, you always need something to eat, but you, you somehow want something that just powers you through yeah. sometimes but, and, can, yeah. and is familiar. And I understand that, but I think the sandwich is interesting because you return to ones you know and love. You know, whether it's cheese and pickle or crisp sandwich or something like that. But at the same time, because our fridge is always full with different leftovers, mm. it's also a bit of a journey into something new. Mm. Yeah. I was going to say about the bread. Has anyone been to Langer's in Los Angeles? No one. No, you're going to have to give us a primer. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, well, well, no, he's anonymous. We can't point him out. Oh. Um, <laughs> Um, I was there earlier this year with um, Faraz and Ruby, and um, I'm also repping Langer's today with Kat. Um, I know, just remember that, he's in the pay of Big Sandwich. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was. I wish I was. Um, but like Katz's is like the the more the marginally more famous deli in New York. No, no, the one that was always it was Wolf's in L.A. That was always the, you know, that was the one that was all the old, you know, is the it old still guys. around. I doubt it. It's got these upstarts now. <laughs> what do they know from sandwiches? You know. Anyway, um, I think anyone who been to, has anyone been to Katz's? Yeah. Yeah. The the bread's bad. Yep. Like, the, the bread's dog shit. Um, um, and the big difference between, like, the Langer sandwich and the Katzer sandwich is that, like, someone at Langer's has, like, paid attention to the bread. Um, and actually, there's a, I've got a quote from Nora Ephron here who wrote about Langer's sandwich in The New Yorker. Um, she goes, The rye bread, faintly sour, perfumed with caraway seeds lightly dusted with cornmeal, is as good as any rye bread on the planet. And Langer's puts about seven ounces of pastrami on it, the proper proportion of meat to bread. The resulting sandwich, slathered with Golden's mustard, is an ex exquisite combination of textures and tastes. It's soft but crispy, tender but chewy, peppery but sour, smoky but tangy. It's a symphony orchestra, different instruments brought together to play one perfect chord. It costs 8 50 and is, in short, a work of art. Yes, um, and I, I, I get that. Yeah, I was in Margate recently and I was wearing the cap and there was a group of Americans next to us um, being very loud. And then they, um, they were leaving and they saw me, me and the cap and then they, they were like, you've been to Langer's. And then we started, to, but we started talking about the bread more than the pastrami. Yeah. And the pastrami is amazing, but it's, yeah. the, it's the bread that makes that sandwich. And that's, but it is so important the bread, and I think that we all, you know, we had these strange um, preferences, this sandwich should be in brown bread, this should be in white, this should be in rye, this should be in pre-sliced, this one you want to slice to yourself. And I think that it's those sorts of choices which make a sandwich quite creatively satisfying while being very undemanding. Some sandwiches, some breads can be quite an obstacle to eating, like sourdough is often quite yes. challenging and even violent to the mouth. Um, yes, it's, and you know, isn't in the um, Victorian days that those sandwiches were then as not they weren't like that, but it was just because of they were made with stale bread yeah. um, the poor, for the poor. So the rich had very dainty finger sandwiches with the crusts off and white bread, and the poor had what were known as mouth distorters. <laughs> and that's, and now, of course, in the way that um, a slightly decadent thing of, uh, of rich people uh, championing what they think is 
of peasant real peasant food now that the rich pay, you know, whatever's the, the most mouth expensive distorters. is what the rich eat. Whichever, it, whatever's m m yeah. more expensive, I guess, when it was more labor intensive to make white flour and then, and I guess yes. now sourdough. Yeah, I guess, and then it ends up setting the kind of tone and what's regarded as highly and what's looked down upon. Well, I suppose so, but I think no one really thinks you should have a uh, sort of a, a densely woven or heavy sourdough sandwich. I mean, it, it can work, but on the whole, it's, okay, it's better if it's toasted. Once it's toasted, especially if it's toasted in a way that isn't really toasted, but fried in butter in mm. a pan, <laughs> um, it can work more. Yeah. I like your, I don't know what, if it went to a sandwich, but your double, double buttering method. That was more for toast. That was more for toast. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but I think that, um, I think that the layers of what you put in, apart from the main filling, whether it's butter or mayonnaise, people feel very strongly about that, don't they? Well, I think like the wetness in the sandwich is like the most, mm. one of the most important aspects. So obviously like bread is, like inherently dry. Mm. So you obviously need a wet component to balance that. And yeah. like, I think so many of the great sandwiches of the world are like wet sandwiches. But it I think it depends on the longevity that the sandwich has to travel for though. Yes. Like, a tomato can like obliterate a sandwich over the course of eight hours. Well, which, which is why that's, I eat over the yeah. sink. So like tomato. But yeah. also don't you think that, although the bread is important, one of the, one, I think why hot, there are hot sandwiches, but I like regular sandwiches with hot fillings. Is because there's something rather wonderful about the sort of integrity of the bread just dissipating and going so that if you have a sausage sandwich or a bacon sandwich mm -hmm. that actually, and enough fat, you know that you are going to have to have it over the sink or not because the bread starts. Um, just, well, no, but it won't keep together because the fat will melt it. Yeah. And that is wonderful. Whereas a sandwich that you take out all day, like my Vegemite one, has to be serviceable. Mm. And that's, it's utilitarian in a sense. Yeah, the, the, there's so many different criteria applying to the different sandwich scenarios, aren't there? I think once I had an ex who brought tomatoes sliced in a separate tinfoil wrapper to then add to the sandwich at the time of eating to prevent. <laughs> yes. But I mean, I think people have lots of eccentricities about sandwiches, don't they? Yes, I think they do, but that's because they feel much more it's an expression of yeah. what they're about. But I think the toasted sandwich, which I think is, uh, can be a wonderful excursion into, you know, no cutlery eating. By toasted sandwich, do you mean fried in a pan or with a Breville toasted sandwich maker? Or Either. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it matters. There's something to me a bit sad about the way a sandwich machine, you know, like snaps it all off. I know it's neat and it's wonderful. In fact, an Australian invention, the Jaffle, the Jaffle, the, that, the Australians invented the toasted sandwich maker and they call them Jaffles still. Really? I think, yes. So do we have any Australians who will... Yes? Yes. <laughs> uh, may I say you have many contributions to <laughs> culinary nirvana, but that is very, it's a very important one, and we thank you. <laughs> uh, but, but they invented the one that's sealed, and the sealing is quite exciting. I think that when you first get one when you were younger, that makes it an, a, a very, very exciting part of having a sandwich. But, the, but the, for me, maybe it's because I'm not a neat person. I find the, so, the, um, the spillage involved in a non-sealed toasted sandwich makes it feel less remote and less industrial. For me, like a lot of the point, like when I was about nine, of like using a toasty maker or a Breville toasty was actually just to see how much I could put in yeah. and still seal it. Yeah. Like I, there was yeah. me like literally like standing like, yeah. <laughs> on the sandwich yeah. maker like trying to get it down, okay. putting like thick like patties in. Yeah. Or, like I was making patty melts. Mm. Um, they always seemed very, we never had one at home, but they always seemed very glamorous to me. 
Now, I got one. I got one when I moved into my first flat, and I still remember the first meal I ever had in my first flat was a toasted cheese and ham sandwich with a radical, exciting new invention then, we are talking a long time ago, of spring onion crisps. Mm. <laughs> I don't, think one of, spring onion crisp. don't know whether you can get them still, who knows? So were they in the sandwich or did you have no, them? No, I the had them separately. I think there's a very good argument for putting crisps in mm. the sandwich, but I did have them separately then, just, you know, some vegetables with my sandwich. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really like the. One of the, my favourite sandwiches, and I'm not very good at having favourites, but one of my favourites is a sandwich in Rome where, talking about vegetables, but <clears throat> um, overcooked broccoli. Yeah. I want to say very mushy broccoli in a sandwich, which yeah. I feel like overcooked broccoli is something that British people maybe abhor slightly, but mushed up broccoli. I oh, know, they're so cheese. good at it. The way they keep it on yeah. a sideboard in Italy. Yeah. They exactly. overcook the vegetables, keep it on a sideboard for you to use whenever yeah. you want. And, it's, it's, and what it's, else did it have? Cheese? It, um, yeah, and I just let the, he, I let the guy tell me what to have in it yeah. because he knew and I, I was a novice. But it, it was, I think, some provolone and some kind of meat and he warmed it slightly. And it was with, not, not too large, quite, quite thick bread, but not too thick. And it, it's in a kind of worker's cafe where, every, where everyone is having, in their overalls, and they're having a kind of litre yeah. of wine at lunchtime. Um, well, I have brandy at breakfast, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> grappa. Yeah. But also the Italians really nice. are really good at the cold breaded escalope in a sandwich. Oh, yeah. Are you looking at me? No, I was just no. gazing. <laughs> I was just thinking, I was just thinking, oh, that's so delicious. Well, I, I mean, we could just, like, preempt like the question about what your favorite sandwich is i don't which, know they, well, well, one we, shouldn't ever have one favorite that's no, terrible. but like one it's context one, dependent one yes. thing which so much so yeah. with a sandwich yeah. yes <laughs> i don't have a favorite sandwich but one thing i will do is if there is an escallop sandwich on at a place i will order order the escallop sandwich mm, yeah. um and most of the time this is very disappointing because most places in london just uh pre-fry like early in the morning um and then put too much stuff on it. And there's like one, one place which you might know, actually Vittles is running a, a profile on them next week um, called Scotty's in Clerkenwell. And even though it's intensely annoying and it's more annoying for them because um, people like Isaac have written about it and more people are going there to order this escallop sandwich, um, they still bread them and fry them to order. Um, and they have like I think about thirty five. Oh, so you eat it, so the escalop is hot in your. The escalop is hot. No, but see in Italy it's a cold one, which I, is so good. It can be good, but I think yeah. this. No, I can see a hot one would be hot one, hard. and then with like with lemon, lots of lemon yes. on. Yes, delicious. Um, it's perfect, and so if you, I, I don't think anyone else, is, if anyone wants to come up to me afterwards and tell me where it's doing, um, fry to order a scallop. But lemon is a crucial thing in a sandwich. I actually put a bit of lemon juice in your Vegemite sandwiches uh -huh. um, as well. It makes everything alive. And when I do smoked salmon sandwiches, I like, and I take approval, but that it's always a big mistake when people put lemon juice. I always put, I always put lemon zest, grated lemon zest in mine, because you get all the lemon but without making the sandwich wet. There's a style of making po' boys in America, yeah. um, so like sort of uh, fried shrimp sandwiches, where you, instead of putting lemon juice on it, you actually like very, very thinly shave the lemon, mm -hmm. and you actually have the whole, the lemon hot, like with the pith and the rind yeah. in, nice. which is apparently, I've not tried it, but it's apparently like a very good alternative to actually putting juice on. I'm, I'm willing to try it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I am going, I have a very small, so I, did, so some people did send me some of their favorite sandwiches from, and someone has said that mashed banana with amaretto is excellent. <laughs> you see, that's another thing is that as things you were given as children, obviously you might not have been given the amaretto, <laughs> um, but a mashed banana sandwich. I, that when I was a child, Apart from the fact that you often had sugar sandwiches, mm. um, but also some that I used to be <laughs> given some, not by my mother, I can tell you, but I used to be given sometimes, um, so it would just be white bread spread with butter and hundreds of thousands. 
Ooh. in it. And that like was... Hagelschlag. I mean, that yeah, me. but yes, the the um, Dutch do yeah. the that one with the little chocolate vermicelli. And I thought I yeah. I put it on toast because I thought that's what you was, it was supposed to melt. But then I got tweeted at by. Oh. Uh, but yeah, you're supposed to have it on soft white bread. Yes, with butter and yeah. crunch. Yeah. But um, the, what, there's a sandwich which I actually feel like so bad that I haven't tried it out before tonight, and I should have. But is a one in um, Mrs. Beaton, where it's a toast sandwich. And you have toast in between two slices of bread. Oh my God, amazing. <laughs> and, but her, she doesn't butter. I would butter the toast. I think, if I think of how that should be made and having not eaten it, I think you need white bread toasted, thin, and you need slightly thicker white bread for the sandwich. And Un I think untoasted. it could be rather... Untoasted, so that's then you have her. The, the sort of caramelised bread in the middle. And then yes, the I think it bread. should be buttered, but I think it'd yeah. be quite good with that um, that anchovy spread that used to be called gentleman's relish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I think that would be good. But when I was reading about it, it sort of reminded me of the, you know, that there's a particular chung fun you, you can get, yes. which has got like bread. It's often called donut chung fun. Yes. And there is something, obviously, in cultures mm. that does feel about the crunchy bread with the soft bread or the, you know, the, the flour and water, whatever it can be. And I think that's in a way why sandwiches right, are yeah. interesting because they are so basic because you, you really don't get anything. There's a book I was meant to write so many years ago called The Staff of Life and about a history of bread and sociology of bread. And I'd be, <laughs> it's on my back band of pages, but this, this very elemental food stuff, you can't get much more. This is the earliest human food stuff in a sense, apart from, you know, animals. Um, but I do think that even though we don't think of it in that way and people buy bread and don't make bread, there is something still that is, which is why when people give up carbs, it feels to me that somehow that, I'm sure you can live like that, but somehow it seems to me <laughs> that you are dehumanising how you eat <laughs> because I think it's very hard for us not to think... I mean, bread is... I mean, in other countries, you wouldn't have food without bread on the table. It just seems to me that it's so uh, important to who we are and different cultures have breads which express who they are. And then if you do away with that and therefore the sandwich. I, do, I think this is a very impoverished life spiritually as well as just <laughs> hard to hedonically. Imagine. A society without any sandwiches is hard to imagine. Although actually, I, I don't know, I don't think this is a sandwich, but we don't have to get into that. I have a very unpopular opinion, which is I prefer a burger in lettuce oh, yeah. than in a bun. Once. I do. I can't eat it because I make it all melt because I have all the other bits in it. But it's so rare. If I've made my own soft white bread, I will put a burger in that. But I, I, have, I can't find a bun mm -hmm. that's made that I really want. <laughs> With a burger. Well, not even a not? McDonald's cheeseburger, no. Sorry. No, I know. I know. The only time I've liked that kind of, when I was pregnant, I used to have to go to Burger King and order Whoppers, but it's the only time. I, it's not, I don't, it doesn't feel like food to me because it doesn't come from a time in my life that I have any no nostalgia for. I want to talk a little bit about McDonald's now. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, McDonald's is like, I, I feel like one of the, big declines in our society over the last kind of 10 years is the self-ordering machines at McDonald's. Mm. <laughs> and what it's done, what it's done is it's ruined the double cheeseburger because what used to happen before is that you had all the burgers out on the racks which were made in advance. And the McDonald's double cheeseburger only tastes good once the bun, the cheese, and the hot meat have kind of fused to form this kind of one material. <laughs> and, and then you eat it and it, it's like disgusting and delicious. 
And what happens now is when you sell, when you order from the machines, um, the burger is assembled in front of you. Oh, so it hasn't had time to so seep into itself. So it's, had no, it's itself. had no time to seep into itself. It's, the cheese is still unmelted. It's That's spent really... no time on the racks. And it's just a bizarre example of a big, big company prioritising, I don't even think it's convenience, I don't know what it is, but over the actual delivery of well, Presumably that. they think it's better like that. They want to, you know... I no, I, I can't... I, I mean, I... I, I, I think where I, I live in Essex, they don't do that yet. <laughs> well, no, I, there, there, are, um, there are a few places left in London who um, still do it on the racks. Um, my big tip is that in Bond Street Station, you can go in and there's a McDonald's, which a very small McDonald's, and they're still doing them on the racks. And that is the best place to get a McDonald's double cheeseburger in London. I know. I, w I, w I wish I would like it. In and Out Burger is the burger I in when I'm in LA, which I think is. Good. But but that is a McDonald's burger. That's just no, a, it's but, but, not. Bet but better. Well, well but no, better. Well, I mean, that's an idiotic thing to say. I love it. <laughs> Um, you know, <laughs> but, it, but it tastes like what a McDonald's burger like thinks it tastes like. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but again, there I like it in lettuce. Sorry. I feel like to, to go back to Sam. and I sometimes like to put chips in the whole thing mm. with the lettuce. So I say you have to eat like that. So it's not an anti-carb thing. It's just that so rarely does the does does the bread. Do you No, I, d I love plastic bread. I'm not a snob about bread, but those buns seem to me not... It's too much. Yeah, sometimes they can be cakey and dry, which isn't very nice. No. I feel like I've asked a few people in the last few days about what sandwiches they like, and I feel like almost more than any other food, p people telling me what sandwich they're having or what they sandwich they like has the potential to surprise me or say something I haven't heard. So somebody on I need a report now. Somebody on Saturday told me that their favourite sandwich is chicken and coleslaw, which I've never had, and I'm kind of intrigued to mm. try. And then I'm, um, a friend messaged me today, the writer uh, Anna Kinsler, said she was having from a sandwich shop ham, emmental, and sun-dried tomato, which the sun-dried sun tomato for me was a curveball in there. I'd never have thought of that. No, I know. I do, I, I, it's a I bit suspect. I can't agree with that. <laughs> But for her, for her, it brought some some saltiness that she some sort of intense umami that she wanted in that. Anyway, she said for her it lifted the cheese or whatever. Anyway, but I feel like yeah. I kind of like with your lemon. I feel like for so many people, there's a kind of twist or an unexpected combination or a, a slight strangeness or an unexpected and unanticipated quirk of whoever's having the sandwich. I mean, maybe this is a good time to... Uh, to uh, yeah, but to that's why it's interesting, I think. Sandwich. Yes, we need to know if there are any sandwiches we haven't eaten. Any we should. Sandwich any freaks, audience. come forward. I would, I mean, <laughs> you know, we've got enough on the stage. <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, Coco's also here made it... I'm not normally like a kind of mushy sandwich or like go that at sort of out there with combinations. But, I mean, this is a kind of canonical sandwich but um she she made a mango and cream sandwich mm. um cold. how was the cream manifest was it whipped cream it was whipped yeah. and cold um on ship white bread it was delicious a very delicious way of eating mango um, that sounds good. actually somebody tweeted today peanut butter and peaches um which i was intrigued by <laughs> We're just going to spend the next <laughs> half hour naming. Something. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it, yeah, it's like almost like a, a poem or something, and that the kind of real strange juxtapositions are sort of held together, as you were saying, Nigella, like by the form of the, the frame of the sandwich. And I mean, yes, what, and then what that's can enter why. That space? But I think that's, but that's also what makes people who would be f maybe slightly intimidated while cooking be more creative and open while making a sandwich. One, because it's not something you do when you feel there's necessarily someone else there judging, eating, or watching you. Yes, I suppose you can hide it a bit, can't you? But also because you are, you know, the, yes, you can make sandwiches with other people, and, and I love doing that. Uh, but I also think there is something which you are just dedicated to your own pleasure mm. about making a sandwich that means that you, f you, can, you forget people who would perhaps feel that something was expected of them if yeah. it's something on the hob that then it's some, that you're just doing it for yourself and 
going yeah. going in perhaps without fear of judgment. And it's at a scale where it's not if it doesn't feel like the world's ended if it goes wrong, like yeah. a big meal oh, where you does a bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But it, is, yeah. it doesn't feel... It's only disappointment. Yeah, I mean, it's maybe not... if it's a caviar sandwich. But, you know, just in terms of what, what, what you haven't sort of over, you know, cooked a, a bird until it was... No, no, no. I just feel that somehow it's very hard to assemble a sandwich with an, without having great hope in That's your heart. True. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, because it is just this, as you say, this uh, building. You, mm. you build a sandwich... It, don't you? That's what Americans say. You build a sandwich, and there is something hopeful about that building work. That's very moving. Yeah. I'm very moved. It's very moving. I'm, um, I think we should open up to yeah. the, the floor. Um, right. Oh, look, someone's put their hand up already over there. I see so. Over, oh. over, you, you, you. I think the first hand was fifth. That was back. yours. That was you, yes. Hello. Oh. Um, firstly, I think Nigella, you should have a panelle. Is that right, Rebecca? Sandwich yeah. like a deep fried chickpea batter in a roll with butter. It's very good. Um, oh yeah. So what is it? It's panelle. Yes. No. Yeah. Yes. I know. Yeah, the in a sandwich though. Yes. I think when it's fried and it's crisp, it's wonderful. I know it more as the Italian farinata. Yeah. Yeah. Which is. Have you had one, Rebecca? Glorious. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wanted to ask if you had any stories about sandwiches and shame. I thought that was fine to ask because Nigella's already asked, uh, been talking about death, so shame seems a fine topic. Oh, oh God, I don't, how odd to equate <laughs> shame with death. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I was thinking the other, so I've got an anecdote, I'm sorry about this. Um, but I was in Morrison's the other day and there was a lady and she was looking for sandwich spread and I was like, yeah, sandwich spread. Where would that be? And it's it is there's still gentleman's relish in Morrison's, and it's in that sort of pate section. But I remember having that as a child and kind the of sandwich bread was you know kept with the salad dressing. Yeah, it's still there, but like, I, I wonder if anyone was. still has it. Um, but yes, yeah, shameful sandwiches, if any. I guess like with at school or something, maybe you know everyone's bringing out their pet lunch and like who's got what sandwich, and maybe like if you feel like your sandwich doesn't fit in with the, the like the sandwich norm or sandwich status quo, that could be. I've always felt my sandwiches. No, I mean my mum's an amazing sandwich maker actually, so I would never criticise that. So actually, I'm not going, even going to go there. <laughs> no, I don't know. I think shame and food is um, a sort of slightly different. I think that that I that I feel that that's the whole point about a sandwich. You make it for yourself. You're not making it for inspection for inspection from outside eyes. So it isn't very shame-based. If, if anything, it's just pleasure-based. I guess if it smells like an egg sandwich in a closed train carriage. <laughs> um, I think it's the school thing again of being given something that you're not particularly asked for or you're having. It's what comes from the sandwich to me that seems to be the point. I mean, sometimes I ye yearn, for, anyway, for white sliced bread, and I didn't have that, but... I think Jonathan. it's a shame I've had so many bad sandwiches in the yeah. last five yeah. years. Yeah. But, no, the only, the only shame, shameful thing is actually not Penele, is um, the other Palermo sandwich, which is the spleen sandwich. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, which I thought I would be very into. And this has happened twice to me with spleen, by the way. This has happened in Palermo and it's happened in Tokyo at um, the fish market. Um, when all the fishermen in the morning, they have like this spleen stew. Um, rocks. The last thing you want is fish. Um, and in Palermo, where you have a spleen sandwich, and I really struggled to finish it at both times, mm. and I didn't want to leave anything, so I did everything humanly possible to avoid the shame of not finishing that sandwich, mm. like just like lemon after lemon after lemon. <laughs> Um, it is full on. Yeah, it is very full on. Yeah. More questions? Jonathan, do you want to Who's doing the choosing? I don't want the responsibility. Jonathan, you pick the next oh, question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Is it me? 
Question principally for... Where, who's got the... Will you stand up? Sorry, otherwise oh. it's impossible to see where you are and it's nice to see. I would love for I you can to see you me. now, but... Yeah. Uh, this question is principally for Nigella. And I'll take your word as gospel on this. <laughs> Not all sandwiches, but can some sandwiches be picky bits? And at what point does a sandwich stop being picky bits? No, it can't stop being a picky bit. Never. Um, unless it's a very small component of, you know, of some crisps and gherkins, maybe, you know, a bit of meat somewhere. Because I think the thing about picky bits is it's uh, the permutations of the order you can eat ch can change. And it's much more like an indoor picnic. Whereas a sandwich, in a way, you, you don't, the whole point is it's like a risotto, that, that what each mouthful sh is vaguely like the mouthful you, or, or completely like the mouthful you had before. And that's why, in a way, it's an engineering job, because, it, you know, you have to have, you, you need the, when you structure it, you don't really, I don't think you really want the left top corner of a sandwich to be that different from the right bottom. Whereas when you have a sort of assemblage of picky bits or an indoor picnic, that that's the whole point. Mm. That, that, that you don't quite know what you're going to put together with what. So I think context is so important in eating. And there are times, and I think this is why sandwiches are comfort food in the way that risotto or mashed potato, not just because a carb is involved, but because when you, you're in need of comfort, you want to have um, a multiplicity of bitefuls that are the same. When you're feeling quite sprightly and want to eat food that's interesting, that's the last thing you want. You want to feel that you can make different mouthfuls that will bring you something else. Anyway, that's my view. Sandwich is pretty self-contained. It's, you know, it's, pretty, it's pretty complete in itself. Yes, although you, you know, there are people who like to dip sandwiches. Oh, yes, that's true. And that's, an, mm. that's a whole other world. Yeah. <laughs> we have some questions online. Can I uh, do a couple of those? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we have a lady called uh, Sheila Watson who is wondering, uh, I think this is for any and all, if your personality was a sandwich, what would it be? And then she carries on to wonder about personality and sandwiches with Boris Johnson, Madonna or Tim Henneman. What? 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 Is she at the right talk? <laughs> if your personality was a sandwich, what would it be? Wait, say that again. If your personality was a sandwich, what would it be? <laughs> I'm, I'd go for a Vada Pav. I'd be very pleased, just stodge on stodge. A lot of heaviness, but some spice. Maybe that requires a level of self-knowledge I don't yet have. I think you just make it up is the yeah, point. Yeah, okay, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I do really like chip, uh, chip sandwich. Mm. And my first job was an efficient chip shop and that was very nice having chips in a roll or there is a, a roll is a sandwich isn't it yeah yeah that is fantastic we like a lot of potatoes in a sandwich in fact when I was making the sandwiches I saw I had some leftover um new potatoes with I had in the buttery and I nearly made some potatoes oh just very God. quickly because I thought oh, no, that would be so <laughs> what about you yeah. you're looking you're just going to be um I, I'd have a I'd be a pastrami on rye with chess mustard because there's nothing I would add or take away from myself. Mm. <laughs> I do like, I mean, ham with thick cold butter in very nice bread is, I mean, but I don't know, I'll just start listing sandwiches I like, which isn't really the best. That's okay. <laughs> that's a positive, that seems to reflect well upon yourself image that you're choosing sandwiches you like runs I'm, I'm so ready to go down sandwiches <laughs> I don't like for my own personality so I feel it's better to check oneself <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. is there another online question or uh, there's lots in the audience too yes it's tons uh, it's so frightening be having to choose I'm, you don't okay, feel like you're very you happy there. doing it either hello 
everybody is talking about sandwiches, but what about the bagel that's like a sandwich and is getting more and more popular? Yes, but it's becoming more and more adulterated and wrong. <laughs> um, there's, Your there's, opinion? There, there's... No, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> they're not bagels. For one, yeah. they're fluffy buns with holes in them. They're not bagels. And also, a bagel isn't there to be a party trick. It should be stodgy, dependable, with not that many. And as for this everything bagel, I really despair of the universe. <laughs> The bagel is not to be played with. It's, it's, it speaks of despondency. It doesn't speak of joy. It's just a wonderful thing. Oh, putting your teeth into a, a, an exciting sandwich bagel? No. Would be fantastic. Not, no, no, we don't want to be excited by a bagel. We just want it to be a bagel. I'm just bringing up another. I'm just responding to you as the only way I can. <laughs> Um, sandwich bagels haven't made it to where I live yet. I mean, a smoked salmon one, okay, but really a bagel is better toasted anyway. Toasted and really loads and loads of butter. Yeah. Um, there's someone in this audience who is writing a bagel guide at the moment, and he had his really? head in his hands at the question. Really? Yeah. I need to speak to this person. <laughs> you do. <laughs> um, yeah, but we, we were talking in the, in the room about... In the, the Chaucer room. About um, bagel, <laughs> bagel shop. And bagel. Yes, I corrected him when he was saying about the bagel bake. I said, and, bagel, uh, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> that um, I, I think the, the salt beef bagel, bagel there is one of the worst things they do. Your salt beef should be in rye. It shouldn't be in a bagel. I don't want to know any more. Never, never bring it up <laughs> in front of me again. <laughs> But, but a bagel can have smoked salmon. It can have smoked salmon and cream cheese. What else do you want to put in there? Yeah. yeah, that's true, I suppose. <laughs> but that, again, shouldn't really be in a bagel. Um, oh, OK, you, you've got, got a mic. You've got a mic. Um, I was to guess that the day of the year that people eat most sandwiches is probably Boxing Day, I'd want to say. Um, I wanted to ask if you think the rules... It's probably a bit of a leading question. If the rules go out the window a little bit with sandwiches at Christmas around the festival. The rules period. of society go out the window on Boxing Day. <laughs> it's exactly the answer I was looking for. You're um, so right, though. Christmas is all about sandwiches. And are there things that you would put in a sandwich at Christmas that you wouldn't ordinarily... Permit's probably the wrong word, that you wouldn't... Yeah, cranberry do. sauce. Bread sauce. Mm. Yeah, bre no, yeah. bread sauce, I'm beginning to think there's room for it every day. But yeah. bread, <laughs> bread sauce in a sandwich I think the, is, the, is uh, uh, And I feel, along with all the whole thing of... of you know, the turkey, and my family, when we do Christmas sandwiches, along with the turkey, but if, if there's any leftover potato, it's leftovers of everything, but I think it needs mango chutney in there as well. Mm, my dad likes that. Yes. Yeah, he agrees. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I mean, that's really why a lot of people, I happen to like turkey, but a lot of people sit through the turkey just so they can have sandwiches the next day. <laughs> there is a sort of collective joy in everyone seeing what they can, how much they can all put in their sandwiches at yes. the same time and watching yes. each other and watching them collapse and the, the collapse is part of it I think I think it's so really too nice oh God, so good. But it's also like I think we've both written sandwich articles for the Guardian but my <laughs> mum was on the Boxing Day sandwich and it's you have this mm -hmm. the whole point of the Christmas meal is the same thing every year like what other meal are you going to have the same like all the time mm. but then the Boxing Day meal is always like whatever you want it to be mm. and it's a complete expression of like personality yeah yeah agree so no rules hi um i'm canadian i've lived here for 17 years and i just think that someone needs to write a guide for immigrants on british sandwich culture because what I have learned over 17 years your man. and from, you know, my friends and family and husband now in terms of what, you know, anyway, I just, that's, that's just one thought that I had. If I knew all of this before I came, I think I would have fared a bit better in some situations. What, what, what um, happened? What's the worst sandwich you had? No, it, it wasn't even in terms of that. It was just in terms of like, if I said, let's have bacon sandwiches for breakfast, that to me means that you toast the bread. But clearly, no. it does not mean that here, which is just bit, you know, a grilled cheese sandwich versus a cheese toasty. These are not the same things. A breville and a flat, you know, there's lots of nuances. Anyway, maybe I should write the book, but I, I just... Maybe you should. Yeah. 
but I think it's an important guide for immigrants coming to this country yes, to understand. Although it, I that. presume that the sandwich culture has changed since when you first arrived and now. Probably, yes. Um, probably a lot. Yeah. 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 That wasn't my question, though. That was just another thought that I had. I'm sorry, I don't want to take too much time. But I wanted to ask about sandwiches as an act of community building, as an act of showing care um, and love for others. Um, my retired teacher mother in Toronto has become embroiled in a sandwich brigade, as they call themselves, where neighbors and women have started to make sandwiches on Saturdays. They deliver them to someone who delivers them to someone who takes them to homeless people or to uh, immigrant communities or refugee communities, and they've gotten all kinds of, of different folks involved in terms of bakeries that have day-old bread and who has more freezer space and all kinds of things. It's become this political movement almost, which has been lovely to watch. But I'm just curious about thoughts you might have on sandwiches as community building or as as, as political? Well, I, I think building. certainly sandwiches is very much a food that parents give their children. And I think it's whenever, so if ever there's been a catastrophe, you would make a sandwich for someone. I mean, I think that you, you, you might cook for them anyway, but there's this idea of that someone who may be not up to eating, whether through grief or illness or something like that, or heartbreak, that somehow they can hold a bit of a sandwich and eat it. And I think that there are many of us who, and I suppose because of when people do like things for school communities or charity things, you know, almost automatically you've got your heart, lots of sliced bread there and you're spreading and, and, and also, that often different people get together and one person does the spreading of the butter, the other person does the filling, someone else cuts, someone else wraps, and it becomes communal in that way. But I think it is perhaps a way of feeding people without presuming on that person having either the appetite or the energy or the spirit to eat food proper, and I think that's why it's a, something that's about taking care of people. Yeah, because so, they're, they're quite an approachable, they're quite an approachable thing, as, as Nigella says, you can take it in your hand and you don't have to perform eating in a particularly stressful, yeah. dramatic way, or hold c cutlery, or, yeah. And it also means you can give food to people even if you're not in a position to go out and buy a whole, whole load of ingredients. You can afford, you know, you can get bread, butter, some sort of spread and something else. So I think it's something that, you know, I think that it, it enables a, a wider number of people to be to be generous and to give, which is what people want to, and it's difficult when when they can't. So I think in that sense too, it's it, it doesn't it doesn't demand much from the maker or the eater. It's a completely different answer, um, but I was thinking earlier that, like London, London's cultures, they're not really set up in like 2023 to like have a big sandwich culture. I actually think um, we have a great rap culture, which is a different thing entirely because most of the um, most of the people who come to London are from rap rather than sandwich culture. Well, that probably predates the sandwich anyway. It, exactly, um, but I was, I was thinking like where in London um, is there like a thriving sandwich culture? And it's at the moment like mainly in North African shops. So if, if you're on the, on the Blackstock Road or um, in Shepherd's Bush or in Lewisham. Um, but Scotty's is as well. I mean, everyone tells me about that. But, anyway, but, sorry to interrupt. No, but Scotty's is like a, it's a huge anomaly, okay. I think. Um, whereas these sandwich shops are kind of like, they all have the same menu. And they're, they're all making sandwiches in roughly the same way, which is baguette, um, merguez, liver, chicken, mm. st steak haché, chips, harissa, mayo. And it's like that combination, like all the time. But they've become like really big sort of focal points, mainly masculine spaces. Um, but they've become real focal points for the community because they're, they're a very simple, cheap thing made very, very well. Um, and I, I think there's something like very noble in like dedicating yourself to sandwich making yeah. because you never get the products that a chef will get 
and it takes the same amount of skill. It kind of like requires you to kind of abnegate yourself um, in a way. Um, you don't draw attention to like the touches you're making because they, they tend to be very, very small. Mm -hmm. But like paying that amount of attention on a small thing without that much fanfare for yourself to give someone pleasure, I think there's yeah. something quite noble about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was my answer. Um, there's one at the back. Oh, I can see someone with holding a microphone. Oh, um, oh yeah. yeah uh, really, uh, two things that Magella said earlier. There are still spring onion crisps. Tato in Northern Ireland makes spring onion crisps. Oh, great. <laughs> but that also, uh, like, that got me thinking about hyper-local or local breads throughout the United Kingdom. So one of the sandwiches my mum used to eat was Mars Bar and Apple on Vida. And I don't know if people know what Vida is here. Yeah. It's like a dark malt bread that only you only get in Northern Ireland. Wonderful. And then local. Then recently there was the Morton's Bakery in Glasgow that went under and they make like crispy rolls. And it was like a big thing for the people of Glasgow that they might not be able to get Morton's rolls anymore. Yeah. So whether or not anyone has like a sandwich that they like that's on some sort of regional bread. I was thinking about your burger problem. Oven bottom muffins. Stotties. When I, I used to work at Newcastle University and I used to go into the Victorian covered market and have stotties with peas pudding and ham. And it was just very joyful and it has such a distinct shape. Mm. I, I think the stot, apparently I was working with some poets in that job and that one of them was writing, anyway. Apparently the stock comes from the sound that the dough makes when it hits the the, the oven yeah. floor. Anyway, they're and the, and the, they're very. I old. thought they were made on griddles. I think that's something else. Oh, right, no. Yeah. Um, there's, there's another regional dough product, the name which escapes me, which is made on griddles. Yeah. Anyway, they're, they're quite flat and broad. Yeah. Very suited to smooth peas pudding and ham, and this, which I just think is, I don't know how many people have had peas pudding in sandwiches, but it's very nice. Yeah. It's very nice in all NFS yeah. So in my other life as a tea person, my colleague Alex is from Newcastle, and he goes on and on about Stotties. Yeah. And like peas pudding and ham. It's stock. so good. Um, yeah. There's, I don't know if anyone remembers this, and I might have been hallucinating it, but um, in Chinatown about 10 years ago, there was like a little boom of street food which was, like, I think, technically illegal, which is why they clamped down on it. Mm. But they were making raw jamur, which has since become like very common in, in Xi'an restaurants here. And at the time, I don't think there was like the infrastructure to like, they didn't, there wasn't like raw jamur, there wasn't the bread for raw jamur, and they, they weren't making it properly. Mm. And there was one stall which were using Tesco muffins. And it was so good. It was like it was actually like the perfect thing. It was like this like great fusion of like a British like bread and a Chinese sandwich. And now I think no one would do it because they, you'd either make make it yourself like one plus one do, or you you'd get it from like a, a big like supermarket. Um, but that was like my favourite kind of like. This will do mash up, which was actually great. Um, just one here. And oh, there's yeah. one at the back there. Hello. Um, I've, we've got a question on behalf of a friend who couldn't make it. It's a very specific one we promised we'd ask. But the first part is what age were you when you first had a crisp sandwich? And then the second part. And uh, what crisps would you choose for your crisp sandwich? Um, probably older than I think. I don't think I had Chris Sammers as a like child. On a school trip, and like people all discovering together that they could put their packets of crisps in the sandwiches their parents had given them. And for me, definitely cheese and onion. I love cheese and onion crisps. Yeah, cheese and onion or salt and vinegar. No, salt and, I'm salt and vinegar, I have to say. I mean, I, I think I might have been quite young. I mean, I just, again, just for the. Not that I was given them, but we did them. My my late sister Thomasina always she was very she favoured a crisp sandwich, but she also was very keen on a sandwich that I don't know if it holds up strictly of her own devising a vinegar sandwich. Where you just soak two pieces of bread in vinegar and put them together. <laughs> um, which could also work. So I think I had her crisp sandwich. I mean I think in a way, uh, you know, probably ready salted should do in a sandwich mm. too but the trouble is 
everything has too little, for my liking of crisps, they just reduce the salt too much, you know, that really is so that ready salted is just nothing flavored crisp now. <laughs> and salt and vinegar doesn't hurt the roof of your mouth the way it should do. Um, there's a question down. Yeah, right. Yes, With there's a the white shirt. Ecru. <laughs> 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 yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd ask this, seeing as we are in the British Library. Um, Rebecca, you mentioned Ursula Le Guin. Jonathan, you mentioned Nora Ephron. Um, so I wanted to know, what are the great sandwiches you've come across in literature? Hmm. That's a very good question. I don't know if I can just pull one straight to mind. I've got one, but I, it might ruin something I want to write in the future. Okay, well then. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say it anyway, but, but it's not really like... There's not a particular sandwich, um, but in terms of, like, descriptors of food, um, the Red Wall series by Brian Jakes, mm. who, who I think actually, like, because he was writing kind of early, sort of late 80s, early 90s, I think anticipated a lot of the move back towards a kind of nativist British food culture, um, kind of inadvertently. But um, those kind of like uh, descriptions of um, sandwiches that they would take on journeys, and then they'd just be like cheese and honey or something. Mm. And often the time, like not anything that I would actually eat myself. I always found those descriptions very memorable. Yeah. Um, th the name Vittles is completely ripped off from Brian Jake's but for anyone who doesn't know that, that no, that's it's why. Pier, it's a lot of Dickens, too, Vittles. No, but I mean... Like Whittles. The Whittles, yes. it was pronounced then. Victuals. Yeah, no, but like the, yeah. the, the reason why it's called Vittles mm. is because of Brian Jakes. I mean, there's a lot of good sandwiches in Barbara Pym's novels. But I, I can't know, but I bet they were disgusting, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> I love them, but, it, it was, you know, it was very... Um... Tea with Vicar and some sandwiches. I mean, Dickens... I mean, I, the food in Dickens is always so good because he doesn't go in for much description and somehow it's a bit like... the same in, you know, don't wish to compare him to, you know, you know Hannah Spurry, whatever it's called, but in Heidi as well, that's very good. And they just... In Heidi, she's always, they're always saying meat and fruit and that somehow sounds so appealing. And he has, you know, bread and cheese and bread and meat all the time. And that was, that was a sandwich but it wasn't indicated as such, but there's something about um, letting the reader uh, assemble the sandwich in their mind rather than yeah. having it all written out, which I quite like. There is a good Le Guin one, again, which has, like Nigella mentioned, almost you assemble it yourself, which is cheese, bread, and, and raw onion, um, which is a combination that, actually one of my favorite pubs, uh, they, the only food they do is these hot rolls and, they, and you choose from a, a couple of different fillings. One is which is cheese and onion, and you get a huge wedge of um, mature cheddar and, and half an onion and, and a knife. And the, the roll is hot and buttered, and, you, and it's just yeah. absolutely heavenly. Um, yeah. anyway, yes. And, and anyway, so, um, so the Le Guin uh, reminds me of that as well. Yeah. So a question at the back? Um, or two? Oh, yeah. And Okay. Uh, I think, Jonathan, you said already one sandwich you didn't like, the one with the spleen, Panica Melza, but I was wondering, not to bring negativity, but what's a sandwich that you really didn't like, that you had, maybe you made a mistake in preparing it, or somebody made it for you, something that you really, really didn't like, or your least favourite, if there is. Or it's for I've, I've everyone, the question, never, I've sorry. Ne I've never developed a taste for cheese and pickle sandwiches, which is like uh, like a very British thing. But it's I don't if you use lime pickle. I think it, the difficulty is the pickle that's often used is, in fact, jam. Mm. And that's a problem. I think, just in a way, like so much in food, it's um, about how it's served. So for me, I think, I know that, you know, hygiene laws demand a certain amount, but sandwiches sh should not be refrigerated. Once you refrigerate a sandwich, so much shouldn't, tomatoes shouldn't be, mm. so potatoes shouldn't be. Once things are in the fridge and cold, 
it kills every the, the true properties of what you're eating. And that, to me, is almost more important than the ingredients. I don't really know. Um, maybe I'm quite avoidant of sandwiches I don't think I will like, so I can't really think of one. Is there a sandwich at Pret that you just wouldn't pick up? <laughs> yeah, that's... Um, I, I, I always have the same sandwich in Pret. Which is? Which is a jambon beurre. Yeah. Mm. Although I feel like its quality has declined in recent times. Um, but yeah, because I'm there, I'm risk avoidant regarding sandwiches. Yes, I, maybe a sandwich is not an area you want to take a risk on. <laughs> maybe that's the whole point, that it feels safe. Thank you. We've got time for a couple, one or two, maybe two. Yeah, there's one, one at the back. Hello. Hi. If I was lucky enough to come to your house for a sandwich party and some wine, uh, what sandwich would you prepare for me? Uh, maybe three different types? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're getting a bit ahead of yourself there. <laughs> and what bread would you use? I don't know that it would seem odd to invite people for a sandwich party. <laughs> say crab, so crab sandwiches on brown bread. That's quite, quite, quite nice. I just remembered another really good sandwich from culture. <laughs> <laughs> just, um, actually, this is totally relevant to the question, so let's, I'll say that later. <laughs> Um, okay. I mean, it depends how. If if I didn't have to like worry about showing off, I'd just make fish finger sandwiches because mm. like, everyone likes them. If yeah. you're showing off a little bit. <laughs> the best the best sandwich I made during like the time during lo in lockdown where I was just making sandwiches all the time was um, a shrimp po boy with like. I think I made it with like a very cheesy bechamel as well, which is, is not traditional po boy, and then like lots of brown shrimp butter. Oh, hell. Um, so it was like a double shrimp sandwich, mm. and it was very good. And I'd make that again for someone if I could remember how I did it. When, when people stay over, I bring them breakfast in bed, and I tend to make people breakfast sandwiches pretty often. And I might make a very thin omelette when with some other element, which varies. Anyway, but I think in a way because the sandwich is so personal, I would actually get it's an odd, it's odd because I can't imagine making a sandwich unless I felt I knew the person and felt I could make a sandwich that was right for the particular person. I think that's maybe why often sandwiches aren't terribly interesting if they're not made for people in particular, if they have to appeal to the biggest number. Um, but the, now I can see that. The range of sandwiches we had at the funeral on Friday, in which all got eaten by a large number of people, never, none of whom I'd met, but they were made by the cafe, and we didn't specify flavours to the cafe. They decided what they should be. And that, I guess that's not at home. But anyway, it was egg, ham, cheese, and tuna, which you could argue are four pillars of sandwiches in a certain <laughs> way. Um, and... Yeah, and, and, but there was a nice element to each so that the ham had some nice whole grain mustard. Anyway, it, it was very well done. But anyway, I feel like sandwich selection, yeah, I don't know. I'm just rambling, sorry. No, it, 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 would, be, it would be tricky. I'd have to, you know, have a, a clearer idea of what would make me happy you know, before what's the occasion? I, you know, did that. Because at Christmas, you might be invited. In fact... I did go to a party recently, and it was a sandwich. Sandwiches was the main food at the party. And there was lots of pre-buttered, halved white rolls um, and with sliced cooked ham. And then you could have a plate, and you assembled yourself a little ham roll. And that was very nice. And then choice of various mustards. I do actually wonder if, like, if I invite people around, it probably would be an assemble yourself job. Yeah. Um, that, that. I don't know if we've got time for any more questions or if they're going to yeah. kick us off. Oh, we want any, do you have any more? We haven't done... I feel we've let down our online people. Oh. I don't think you have. I think they're all... They're all, they're all <laughs> that's right. You've gone through the I mean, there were lots of you. questions, but they're very happy. Oh, can I just say the one final sandwich reference that I just remembered, which isn't a book, but it is a film, which is the Mermaid's film with Sharon. Oh, yes. And when she cut her daughter's trying to make a big masculine sandwich for this man she fancies and share 
when she's not looking, puts a star-shaped cutter in it and makes it a dainty little <laughs> femme sandwich. Um, to, anyway, I just wish I just... Sandwiches and films is a great subject, yes. actually. Mm. For, the ne for the next, yeah. the next time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca, Nigella, Jonathan. Jonathan, I can just see the words hot pastrami on the back of your head. Yeah. I, I, feel, like, I feel like you guys have been... See, I feel like that was almost like you guys have been, I don't know, on a, on a desert island and are hungry and just obsessing about sandwiches. And we get, got to sit in on it. It was just really <laughs> fun and lovely. I really want to eat a sandwich now. I don't know about anyone else. Um, I still have a couple left in the uh, torso. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. Um, yeah, thank you. That, that was great. So book signing outside. Um, so, yeah, please kind of form an orderly queue. OK, I need to have a pee break for yes, book signing. So I but a massive round of applause. And thank you for joining us for the food season as well. Thank you.